Hello, my name is Jacob and I am a Norse Pagan. Today, I wanted to get into my 12 favorite Norse Pagan books. These books came to me throughout my life, whether it was through school or through other people, but they have all given me a piece of the puzzle that now allows me to talk to you about how strongly I believe in the Norse gods. I'd also like to say that everything here, I will link, hopefully an Amazon link or a shopping link to their website, or at least somewhere you can find these books as well, or you can contact me and I'll find a way to get one to you. Because especially things like Poetic Edda, I want to make sure every pagan has, so I'm going to do whatever I can to make sure someone gets a Poetic Edda. But without further ado, let's go ahead and move on to my 12 favorite Norse pagan books. Number one, A History of Vikings. So I love this book that I got from Half Price Books because it's boring. It's dry, it's dense, it's long, and it goes way too in detail. So that's also the reason that you should look into it. Um, this book was written by Gwen Jones. Um, I don't know much about the author, um, but what I do know is that whoever compiled this or whatever group compiled this did a wonderful job of going from the very start of like heathenry, the very start of Germanic faith and Germanic people, and moved all the way to like the end of the Christian era in Norway and then kind of lead it into the modern world. Um, but there's so much details in here. There are so many little accounts of little battles and who killed who, who married who, who had children with who. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good read if you can get through it. But one of my favorite stories from this talks about a battle. Um, I don't remember the exact king, um, but it talks about a battle with... Um, uh, rival uh, clan, and it talks about how Odin came down and helped him win the battle, and everyone talked about how Odin was in this battle with them. I mean, that's cool. Whether it's true or not, whether it's actually Odin riding down and fighting with them, it's still awesome. I mean, it's still awesome to read that in a historical book. This is not a religious book. No one wrote this intending for people to believe in Norse paganism. In fact, when it was written probably in the 80s, most people didn't even know it was still a religion, or at least was reviving at the time. So, the fact that it talks about Odin and battles, to us, is amazing. The next book I like to talk about is a little bit different. I've mentioned it before on my Instagram channel if you follow me there, but it's called Black Elk Speaks. The reason I love this book is because it's about the end of an era. It's about the end of Native American paganism. Yes, there are Native Americans who still believe in the old ways, the old gods and spirits, but this is the one of the last accounts from a living shaman in the times before... The res you know, the true reservations and what the Americans have done to the Native American population. Um, so it goes really into detail into his spiritual quest, the dreams and visions he has, the way he interacts with his people. Um, and it even has like a really sad, like, I mean, obviously the Native American story is sad, but his end is sad because he had to eventually convert to Catholicism just to keep his kids alive. Um, and he told his children to be Catholic, you know, follow Catholicism as well. But at the end of the book, he, um, someone takes him up to a mountain, like the person that helped him write this book took him out to a mountain, and he kind of got on the edge, kind of like I did in my last video, and he just called to the spirits and called to the gods, um, and just, just as he was finishing his chant, his prayer, they saw like a cloud form over the valley, you know, in this huge Arizona valley, I mean, hardly any clouds, and just formed right in front of him. Um, so it, it's very strong to my beliefs in how I kind of interact with the gods, comes a lot from the Native American belief because they were very true to what they believed in. Book number three, I think is one of the more popular books people have heard of, and it is Norse Mythology by Neil Gaiman. Um, this is an amazing book. It's a lot of fun. I mean, historical accuracy is probably 50-50. Um, I mean, it, it follows you know, tales very well, but of course he takes liberties, which I'm fine with. I mean, I think it's important that we start creating our own stories. And this is a good step, you know, taking the old stories and making them new. Because, let's face it, I mean, some of the stories, especially depending on the edition of the Poetic Edda you read, are horrible. I mean, they're written by people, you know, old British men in early 1900s, and they're a bunch of thighs and thous and these and all that stuff, and it's really boring. So to have someone like Neil Gaiman, who's a wonderful author, American Gods is one of my favorite books, um, and this is also a really good book. It's a short read. You can take it with you. It's great bedtime story material, too. One day I will read this to my children. I'm excited. So, Neil Gaiman is a very prominent author nowadays about kind of religion um, and kind of turning into a modern century. J.R.L. Tolkien, we have to talk about him because he is probably one of the earliest prominent figures to be like, hey, Norse mythology is kind of cool. 
Well, I don't think uh, J.R.L. Tolkien was a pagan himself. I do think he had alternative beliefs and saw the world in a different way. And I know that he was very heavily inspired. I mean, obviously, he taught Norse mythology. Um, and he has some wonderful translations. So I have Sigurd and Gudrun. Um, sorry, I probably butchered that name. But it's a really good book. It's a really good translation. Um, it wasn't completed by um, J.R.R. Tolkien himself. It was completed by, uh, completed by Christopher Tolkien. But it's a, a collection of his notes um, from his lectures as well as in here. And that is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to read his lectures. Um, so I would highly recommend picking up this book. Book number five. So book number five, I don't know if I love, but it helped me kind of catapult what I believe. So this is a practical heathen's guide to Asatru. Um, if you notice, I don't use Asatru, Asatru um, very often. Um, I don't proclaim myself as Asatru unless someone kind of forces it on me. Um, I think it's a good term. I mean, it just literally means belief in the Asir. Um, but I prefer the term pagan or, you know, Norse pagan because I think it's a more called to what I believe, whereas Asatru is a very modern term. Um, and I find this to be a very modern interpretation of paganism because I kind of sit in the middle, um, whereas this is very scared to make an actual sacrifice. Like, there's no, really no mentionings from what I remember of making a sacrifice of meat in here. Um, go out and sacrifice some meat. Um, I sacrifice swordfish, um, beef, you know, steaks all the time. I mean, this never goes above bread. Um, I don't think the gods want your bread all the time. Go out and sacrifice some meat to them. Um, and this has, this is a little bit on the spiritualistic side, um, but it has, it has good stuff. I, I do recommend it um, just to see what other people believe. It's great a book like this was published. I mean, I don't have a book like this. Hopefully one day I will, um, and it will actually talk about sacrificing meat. But until then, this is a great source. Um, I actually have a couple copies, so if you contact me and you know, give me, talk to me a little bit and ask me, hey, can I have the other copy? Yeah, you can have the other copy. I want other people to kind of read this and see what you think as well. Much respect to the author. Like I said, I always love a pagan book, especially one like this where it's straight up like, this is how you be a pagan or a thought to true. So, yeah. Number six, this big old boy. Um, so obviously, I don't like read this for fun. I mean, occasionally I'll skim through it and find an interesting word, um, but I always like to have a reference around. Um, I need to get an actual old Norse reference, but Old Icelandic is a very good source as well. Um, I mean, it's boring. It's dense. But it's a really good reference guide. It has English in there as well, um, and it's just always good to have a reference to the old languages. Number seven. One of my favorite looking books I have, like, if I could just walk around with this and be like, I am a Norse pagan, it would be great. Um, because I think it's a beautiful book. Um, I don't know how widely available it is. It's available at Barnes & Nobles, at least here in the States. Um, I mean, I'll give you some close-ups here. Um, this is one of my favorite books in my collection because it is so beautiful. Um, I, mean, it's I mean, even the pages are just gorgeous. And it's very basic. I mean, again, it was written by someone I don't believe was a Norse pagan. Uh, but it's a very early book written about Norse mythology. So you have a lot of good information. I mean, it covers all the gods, you know, it covers all the, you know, heroes and legends and has some stories in here. Um, I mean, it goes into a lot of great details. So usually when I have, I need a, just a reference like, oh, hey, what was the name of this? What was the name of that? I definitely recommend checking this book out just because it's such a great reference um, for other people because you can kind of show this to them and they'll be like, whoa, that's cool. And when you start showing them it, you know, it has some really great classical imagery of the Norse gods, Norse mythology, um, and is a very good reference for information. So, highly recommend it. Barnes & Nobles, check it out. And we're to the Poetic Edda, which is, believe, number eight. Um, obviously, you have to have a Poetic Edda as a Norse pagan. Um, now, there are probably hundreds of different um, translations um, out there. I use Jackson Crawford. Uh, one, I'm a huge fan of his channel. I don't th he's very um, open about the fact that he's not open about his religious beliefs. He might be a pagan, but I don't think he is. Um, but he is a scholar, so that's also important because he has a non, um, he has a very unsubjective viewpoint of the religion. Um, he's giving us the facts. You know, he lays it out as, you know, here's what we know, here's what people think, and, you know, this is what actually we have. He's very forward about the fact that we don't got a lot. And so when you read this, he both translates it into a more modern sense, 
but you know he's not putting any personal beliefs behind it. He is just giving us the knowledge. Um, and I must also say, it's nice for an American to do a translation. I know there's a few others that have done one. Um, but he's pretty big. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people that are into paganism have looked up his YouTube channels. Um, and so, yeah, I think this is a really great addition. It's got a great cover. Um, I see a lot of people with these that aren't even Norse pagans. I mean, I've been to gyms and people have these because they're just reading about it. Um, so I think it's a very popular American edition, and I think it, it is definitely worthy of adorning um, your shelves. Um, the next book, book nine, um, is his other book, um, The Saga of the Vol Songs. Um, I mean, it's pretty obvious why I have this. I mean, they come together. Um, you can order them together. I mean, it's just another really great reference. It has a lot of great stories, and I love his translations. Finally, we're getting down to the wire. Number 10. So number 10 is another historical book. Again, not necessarily a religiously written book, but is a great reference guide to gods and Yggdrasil, the story of creation and Ragnarok and all that good stuff. Um, so once again, historical book, a little bit dense, um, a little bit easier to get through um, than others, um, and it's just a really great historical reference. I like to have these around, that way I can kind of compare. You know, I can take this and then the history of Vikings down there, kind of compare it, see what they um, have to say. Um, and it's also a good transition between this and the Norse mythology book um, that has a really great cover because they have very similar information, um, but you can kind of see the differences and where they exist. So this one, number 11. So number 11 is an interesting one. So I spent a lot of money on this because I was dumb and went to an exhibit. Um, they had these. I don't know how many people have these out there, um, but I went to the Cincinnati Museum Center, which is a really good place that a lot of people don't actually go to anymore. Because they have exhibits, like really exclusive exhibits. The last one was just an Egyptian one with uh, stuff about Cleopatra and uh, the pharaohs. This exhibit, well, of course I went to, was a Viking exhibit that only had three stops in North America, if I'm not mistaken. And it had actual artifacts, you know, actual wood from Viking vessels. Um, it had the clothing, it had, you know, manuscripts, runes, um, it had some tablets. Um, it was a really great experience. So the reason I bought this... I think $90 book is because it has a lot of great information. This has the archaeological information in it. So everything I go through, you know, if I ever need to look at some archaeological references, especially things like outfits or designs or colors, I mean, it goes into why they use certain dyes in their clothes. I mean, it's the science book. Um, like, like I said, it, it, this book is weird because it has a little bit of a political agenda. Um, it's talking about how we use the term Vikings. Um, yes, Vikings wasn't really a term used back in the day unless it was used as a verb, where it was like they're going on a Viking, but also it's kind of just in modern context been stuck as those people. Um, regardless, it was really trying to force down our throats like, oh, it's a verb, it's a verb, it's not a noun, but also it can be a noun. So it was a little weird. But great material. They did mention that they didn't have horns on their helmets, which is always helpful, especially to people that don't know much about Norse mythology or history. So number 12, I don't have. I actually need to buy a copy. I had my copy when I was at the University of Kentucky. I basically kept that thing checked out all the time because no one else really looked at Norse mythology in the University of Kentucky, in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, it's called Myths and Symbols in Pagan Europe by H.R. Ellis Davidson, if I'm not mis or Davison, if I'm not mistaken. Again, I'll link it down below. I hopefully have a picture up as well. Um, this book is one of the biggest influences to my beliefs because it's a study of both Germanic, Celtic faith, customs, and history, and comparing that to the gaps that we have in Scandinavian history. Because the Romans talked really heavily about Germanic, um, you know, the Germanic and Celtic faith as they invaded those territories. And then after the fall of Rome and people in Scandinavia started spreading, they could more, can make those connections. So they're like, oh, hey, well, Germans made these types of sacrifices. We found the Celts made these type, and we have reference of these three or four things, which means that Scandinavian people most likely did this. And, you know, it's a lot of connection and drawing. Um, it might not be 100% accurate, but it's really, really good. I do believe that the person that wrote it is a Norse pagan and um, is really fascinated with the idea of connecting the dots and the belief. But yeah, those are my 12 favorite pagan books, or at least reference books. So, until next time, praise the gods, hail the spirits, and honor the ancestors. Thank you very much.